A hundred years into the future, a glorious city called Metropolis reaches for the heavens. One of its most prominent young men, Freighter, son of Metropolis's master Joe Freighterson, relaxes in the Club of the Suns, a magnificent playground of racetracks, theaters, and the world-famous Eternal Gardens. One day, a remarkable woman named Maria interrupts Freighter's festivities with a group of impoverished children from the depths of the city's underground, telling them that they are all, rich and poor alike, brothers and sisters. Maria and her brood are quickly shuffled off back where they belong, but Freighter is forever changed by the encounter and immediately sets out to find Maria. Beneath the decadent and carefree life of Metropolis's upper class, Freighter discovers the brutal machinery that keeps the city running, along with the bruised and battered mass of workers who are constantly fed to it. He immediately takes the place of a worker on the brink of terminal exhaustion and gets a taste of the strenuous existence of the working man. At the end of his first shift, Freighter follows a group to an old underground cathedral where he finds Maria, who boasts the morale of the workers with promises that one day a mediator will come to bring together the head and hands of Metropolis to unite the rich and poor once and for all. Meanwhile, Freighter's father, Joe Freighterson, master of Metropolis, disturbed by reports of saboteurs, sees Maria as a threat to his own power and seeks to remove her. He elicits the help of Metropolis's resident scientist Rotvang to reconfigure the machine in Mensch, a prototype android, into a perfect copy of Maria, capable of following orders and inciting the workers to riot, which Joe hopes to use as an excuse to clamp down on them. Unbeknownst to the master of Metropolis, however, Rotvang has his own designs for the robot Maria, and when he sets them in motion, the entire city and everyone in it, rich and poor alike, are sent to the brink of destruction. In 1924, a precocious young Austrian-German filmmaker, Fritz Lang, hot off the smashing success of his four-hour epic Die Nibelungen, visited New York for the first time. Even at a mere 23 years old, he was a seasoned world traveler, with trips all over Europe, Asia, and Africa already under his belt. Still, nothing prepared him for the awesome sight of America's most advanced city. This visit would inform Lang's vision for the already-in-development Metropolis, a film he had conceived with his wife at the time, Thea von Arbo, who was writing the novel upon which it would be based. When discussing the history of Fritz Lang, it's important to note that most of his stories of his early life are just that, stories. Lang always was a gifted storyteller, and those who have studied him know that most of his anecdotes are at least romantic embellishments, if not outright lies. So, while I am inclined to believe his visit to New York City informed the look and feel of Metropolis to a certain extent, how much of an influence it had is certainly open to debate. Nevertheless, Lang, decades before he would become the icon of early film he is today, was already a gifted and influential filmmaker, and his next project, Metropolis, would prove to be his most ambitious and remarkable film. It didn't start out that way, though, and the film company controlling the purse strings, Germany's UFA, was struggling in its own right under the economic uncertainty of the Weimar Republic. Somehow, though, Lang convinced UFA to pour more and more time and money into the project, with the film's production ballooning well past the limits originally set. In the end, Lang spent an incredible 17 months and anywhere between 5 and 7 million Reichsmark to film his science fiction epic. Ufa was then understandably upset when, upon its initial release, the film grossed less than 100,000 Reichsmark, making it one of the greatest financial flops in the history of cinema, even to this day. In an effort to recoup even a tiny percentage of the money burned away in its production, the film was sold to Paramount, where the negative was butchered from its three-hour original cut into something the American studio felt would be more palatable to audiences, a mere 90 minutes. The cut scenes were then unceremoniously destroyed. Even in its Americanized form, critics at the time hated the film, calling it overly long, dreary, and pretentious. Famed science fiction author H.G. Wells, whose own The Time Machine with its Morlock and Eloy future may have served as partial inspiration for the dualistic nature of Metropolis, wasn't a fan either. And his review in the New York Times is so scathing, it's actually pretty fun to read. I will link it in the description, and I urge you to check it out, as an entertaining counterpoint to modern popular opinion. Metropolis had its contemporary defenders, of course, but it would take many years for Metropolis to find its audience, and it would take even longer for film critics to recognize it as one of the most important silent films ever made. 
Unfortunately, its most notable early fans would be so enthusiastic about Lang's work that they would drive him out of Germany altogether. This happened in 1933. For his film The Testament of Dr. Mabuse, Lang caught the attention of the new National Socialist Government of Germany. Nazis. I hate these guys. According to Lang, he was called to the office of the Propaganda Ministry to meet with Joseph Goebbels himself, and Lang, who was half Jewish by heritage, though not religious affiliation, was understandably petrified. Goebbels did indeed scold him for the testament of Dr. Mabuse, which was seen as a rebellious and dangerous work of art that had to be censored, but far from punishing him for his work or his lineage, Goebbels then went on to praise Lang's earlier stuff, especially Metropolis, a film that was reportedly a favorite of Der Fuhrer himself. Goebbels offered Lang a job as Der Fuhrer's filmmaker of choice, tasked with creating the greatest film propaganda the world would ever see. Fritz Lang then fled Germany, not long after his meeting, and would eventually settle in America, where he would spend the rest of his life making films for Hollywood, including a few anti-Nazi works like Hangman Also Die. He would state in interviews that Metropolis was a silly film that he all but regretted making, in large part because of Goebbels' endorsement, though towards the end of his life he would rediscover an appreciation for it, as a romantic and idealistic work that spoke for the youth, as represented at the time by the growing counterculture movement of the 1960s. This raises the contentious question of Metropolis's politics, a surprisingly touchy subject in academic circles despite the theme of the picture being ludicrously clear. Film historians have concluded that, while Lang was the driving force behind the visual aesthetic of Metropolis, the story and political message of the film belong almost entirely to its writer, Thea von Arbo, whose physical resemblance to Maria is no coincidence. Before we go to the film itself and analyze it on its own merits, we should probably discuss Thea von Arbo. Lang and Arbo were married for just over a decade, but the marriage, which was a second one for both of them, was not a stable one. Lang pursued younger women, and Arbo would eventually be caught cheating on Lang with the man who had become her third husband, which is the generally accepted reason for their divorce. However, Arbo's politics may have also come into play, as the divorce happened around the same time as Lang's meeting with Joseph Goebbels in 1933. After Lang went into self-imposed exile, Arbo stayed in Germany and helped write and produce a library of propaganda for the Nazi government. This is often cited as evidence for Metropolis's alleged pro-Nazi message, but Arbo would defend herself after the fall of the Nazis by claiming she was doing her best to help Germany's Indian population. In her defense, she was secretly married to an Indian man during the Nazi years, an interracial union the government forbade quite forcefully. Arbo was also, by all accounts, a kind, generous, and selfless woman, so it is not outside the realm of plausibility to argue that her work for the Nazis was done with the best of intentions. Still, I I'm not trying to defend someone who willingly produced propaganda for Adolf Hitler. I am merely trying to illustrate that it is faulty logic to argue that her time with the Nazis is definitive proof that she held pro-Nazi sentiments in her heart all the way back in 1924, when Thea von Arbo penned the first draft of Metropolis. Therefore, to settle the matter of Metropolis's political message, one should stick to the text, i.e. the film itself. Metropolis is an absurdly blunt film in making its point, which is one of compassion and mutual understanding. But let's pretend the message isn't so clear. There are segments of the film that appear at first glance to be a manifesto for the working class and a cry to rise up against the oppression of the capitalist system. However, to focus on these elements in isolation is to deliberately ignore the fact that this rising up of the working class is the proximate cause of Metropolis's near destruction, that the workers who rallied in rebellion were so gung-ho in their reckless abandon that they left their own children to die. The working class, far from being portrayed as the heroic saviors of Metropolis, are portrayed as simple-minded automatons easily manipulated by others into either beautiful creation or wanton destruction. They are the hands, devoid of the head. The upper class isn't portrayed much better either, with Joe Friederson's plot to keep the workers in check shown quite clearly to be both short-sighted and evil. This is perhaps the most damning consideration when arguing for Metropolis as a pro-Nazi film. It shows a leader who should not be trusted, which is antithetical to the core Nazi tenet of total faith in Der Führer. 
Rather than inciting the classes against each other, the film is trying to take audiences away from the mindset of class warfare, of choosing the workers over the bureaucrats or vice versa. If the film has a political axe to grind, it is that compromise is too easily discarded by both sides of any political division. Also, take a look at this scene, the famed Moloch sequence that takes place when Freighter first enters the worker city beneath Metropolis. The gaunt masses of shaved heads being herded into a furnace is a prescient and disturbing view of Germany's near future under the Nazis. It's not a prideful call for the people to accept fascism. The film, therefore, is neither praising National Socialism nor capitalism. It is neither communist propaganda nor libertarian wish fulfillment. It isn't advocating any particular system of government or social construction. This is because Metropolis isn't really about politics. It's about technology. Once you look at the plot through the lens of technology as opposed to the lens of politics, everything becomes much clearer. The antagonist of the film is neither the scheming Joe Frederson nor the revolting mass of workers who try to tear down the machine. It is the scientist, Rotwang. Rotwang, apart from being a blatant ripoff of Dr. Frankenstein, represents man's capacity for innovation, for good or for ill. He is portrayed as a broken man who has lost his heart following the death of Hell, Joe's wife, who died giving birth to Freighter. Rotwang is driven by jealousy and vengeance, or envy and wrath to cite the film's recurring seven deadly sins motif, to thwart Joe's plan and tear down everything he has created. And his weapon of choice is the most iconic thing in the whole movie, the Machine and Mensch, one of cinema's most famous androids. The Machine and Mensch is a fetishization of technology, and though it is given the veneer of a heart, its true lack of one is the reason Metropolis is nearly destroyed. Metropolis is mankind's greatest achievement, a futuristic world built by science that reaches for the stars, but it has nearly destroyed the humanity of the people who live in it, be they the heartless upper class that gorges itself on vice, or the mindless workers who slave away without reward. As forcefully as Fritz Lang's visuals seek to make a glorious spectacle of mankind's potential, Taya von Arbo's script warns us of what that potential can do to us if we don't hold on to our humanity. If you want to watch Metropolis today, I highly recommend you seek out the most recent reconstruction, which was carried out after an old copy of one of the original negatives was found in Argentina. The 2010 edition, known as The Complete Metropolis, was published by Kino International, and it is the closest any modern version has ever come to recreating Lang's original cut of the film. While much of the recovered footage is badly damaged, as you may have noticed, they contain scenes and subplots that are absolutely essential including the explanation of Rothwang's motivation and almost everything involving the menacing character of the tall man. My introduction to the film came long before that cut ever existed, way back in the 80s and 90s, when the most readily available version involved a soundtrack consisted of pop music by the likes of Freddie Mercury and Pat Benatar. Watching that version today is a surreal experience, an almost postmodern way to view a Frankenstein's monster of an assemblage of Fritz Lang's vision, Still, even in this bastardized form, Metropolis was enormously influential throughout the 20th century and saw something of a renaissance in the 80s and 90s, inspiring music videos, literature, comic books, video games, and more modern films like Blade Runner and the criminally underappreciated Dark City. Though I can't find any evidence that James Cameron has openly admitted it, I think it's pretty clear his ultra-successful Titanic borrows a lot of elements from Metropolis as well. While Metropolis is not the first feature-length science fiction film ever made, it is one of the most influential. Not only is it a seminal work of science fiction, it's also a landmark piece of film in general, demonstrating an adeptness for spectacle and epic visual storytelling that continues to impress, even as we now approach the 100-year anniversary of its creation when every person involved in it is probably long dead. It also pioneered many special effects tricks we still employ today, such as the liberal use of forced perspective which was used to great effect in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy. Don't let the fact that it's a silent film dissuade you from watching it, because Metropolis is a movie that will hold your attention and provoke your emotions even without sound, and it won't let you go, even after its closing credits. And that's all for today, fellow Earthlings. Thank you so much for watching, and if you like what I'm doing here, please subscribe to the channel to see more. You can also check out my Patreon, where you can vote on what film I'll be covering in the near future and help ensure that I can one day increase the frequency of these uploads. I'm just getting started here, and I could use all the support I can get. 
For written reviews of Metropolis and many other classic works of science fiction, both in film and literature, visit my website at emcgill.com. Until next time, this is The Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love. As long as you're not hurting anybody.